Hi everyone, I'm Martin Olson with the Nevada Department of Wildlife and uh, thank you for joining us for a wildlife conservation education program. Uh, this here is a family program, it's rated PG. Profanity or inappropriate behavior is not tolerated in the chat or the question and answer. All questions in the chat box or in the question and answer box should be on topic and failing to follow these guidelines will result in being muted in the chat or the question and answer or being removed from the live stream. So your chat and your microphone is turned off, but under the Q&A, you can click on that if you're new to Zoom, just by moving your mouse and clicking on that, and then you can ask uh, questions that you would like. Uh, we have several folks, individuals, that are helping us answer the questions. Uh, Nicole Haddon, uh, Lauren McLeod, Holly Brizendine, Abby Sarnecki, Jess Brooks, and uh, we have, uh, this is the 2020 pronghorn webinar. Uh, the program is intended for pronghorn hunters, and some of the photos may not be suitable for all viewers, so keep that in mind. And as we go through this program, uh, if you would like to see more programs like this, uh, please leave us your comments uh, on our survey at the end of this presentation. Uh, if there's other topics you'd like to see as well, please uh, mention those to us so we can bring more of these programs to you. Uh, next to that is the, uh, I'd like to bring up the Nevada Cons uh, Conserve Wildlife License Plate. It's been available since 2011 and proceeds from the sale of that license plate go directly to endow wildlife education and volunteer programs. So today's presentation uh, has several topics and we have several guest speakers who are going to touch on the history of pronghorn, physical characteristics, ecology, habitat, management, and those are going to be done by two southern region uh, game biologists for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. So we got some real experts on these topics. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about scoring and hunting uh, of pronghorn uh, in Nevada. And then we have uh, a field care expert uh, who is uh, going to join us and give us some great table fair tips. Uh, we also have an expert in taxidermy who is going to give us some great tips uh, for bringing, uh, if you end up with a trophy or would like to get a trophy mount, uh, some, some great tips to preserve that. And then uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife also has a law enforcement officer joining us who is going to talk about some of the common violations that we see uh, during some of these hunts. So with that being done, I'd like to introduce first uh, Mr. Joe Bennett, who is a game biologist in the southern region. And Joe is based out of Tonopah. And his number and his email is listed here. And that will come up again at the end of our presentation. He specializes in the units there below, the 16, 17, 21, and 25. But he's very helpful in, in any unit and can point you in the right direction. So, uh, Joe? Yeah, thank you for that introduction, Martin. As Martin mentioned, I'm the Tonopah Game Biologist, and I cover Central Nevada. First, I'm going to be discussing the history of pronghorn, at which, um, if we can go to the next slide, um, early explorers recorded an abundance of pronghorn in the United States during westward expansion. Um, a few fun facts about pronghorn is pronghorn is in the genus Antilocarpa, which is unique to North America and is and only has the one species of pronghorn. It is interesting to note that most people call them antelope, which is actually a misnomer because they are not antelope. They are called antelope in North America because they closely resemble old world animal, antelope. They are also sometimes called goats, but they're not goats either. Um, the historical distribution of pronghorn used to cover the western half of the United States into Canada and Mexico. Seton in 1929 estimated that in, early, in the early 1800s, there were approximately 40 million pronghorn in the western U.S. 
since that time, the early 1800s, due to westward expansion, unregulated market hunting, home, the Homestead Act, the establishment of farms and livestock grazing and fencing, that number went from about 40 million in 1800 to an estimated low of approximately 13,000 animals by about 1920. Um, as you could expect, pronghorn suffered the same fate in Nevada as, it, as in the rest of its range in the 1920s. Um, during this time frame, interest in wildlife conservation blossomed throughout the early 20th century. The Lacey Act of 1900 regulated interstate movement of illegally taken wildlife, and in 1917, the Nevada State Legislature closed hunting seasons for pronghorn, mountain sheep, and elk until 1921. As most of you probably know, in northern Nevada, the Sheldon Wildlife Refuge, this was primarily established for pronghorn, and that was established in 1931 through executive order. Um, this was the time frame or the genesis of pronghorn management in Nevada. In the next sl slide, I'll discuss the five subspecies of pronghorn that are located in North America. Um, and they're in the genus Antilocarpa, the species Americana, and then you have Antiflexa, Oregana, Mexicana, Peninsularis, and Sonoranensis. The two that reside in Nevada are mostly Oregana and Antiflexa, Oregana residing in the northern portion of the state and Antiflexa re, re, um, residing in the eastern part of the state. It is interesting to note that Antiflexa is the most abundant and um, in most western states such as Wyoming, Montana, and as I mentioned, eastern Nevada, and that Mexicana, Peninsularis, and Sonoraensis are endangered and protected. Next, I'll discuss the physical characteristics of pronghorn. It is interesting to note that pronghorn do not have dew claws and that they have split hoofs with the front foot slightly larger than the hind foot. Um, Martin, can you please go back to the previous slide? So the body is distinctly marked being white on the underside or belly and rump with a triple bow tie pattern on the throat, which you could see on this pattern or on in this picture as well as in the next slide. The dorsal coloration or the back is golden brown with a cinnamon tinge, particularly on the mane. It's um, also interesting to note that pronghorn will flare their white hair on their rump when alarmed forming a rosette of white that can be seen from a great distance away. This rosette is a form of communication purposes. And then next we'll compare the size of antelope to deer and mention how, there's, how sexual dimorphism occurs in pronghorn. Um, many people overestimate the size of pronghorn. A mature buck will stand but about three feet tall at the shoulder while a female is about 31 inches or so. In comparison, a mature mule deer buck stands about 42 inches at the shoulder. And this is one reason why a lot of hunters tend to overshoot pronghorn. People are used to seeing deer, and when they hunt pronghorn out in wide open spaces, they look further away than they are because of their small size. An adult antelope or pronghorn weigh between 90 and 120 pounds, and females are about 20 pounds lighter and that's the sexual dimorphism that occurs in the species. Next, I'll discuss the cutaneous or skin glands and a little more in depth of the sexual dimorphism. It's interesting to note in pronghorn that both sexes have horns, but the female horns are vestigial, essentially meaning they evolved to no longer serve a purpose and are no longer functional. And they're only usually a few inches long or occasionally totally absent. The males, of course, have very prominent large horns. In addition to horn size, males can also be easily distinguished by the black markings on the top of their muzzle and forehead, which get darker with age, and the prom prominent cheek patch or subarticular cheek patch, as you can see here in this buck just below the jawline. The cheek patch is one of 11 cutaneous glands that pronghorn have. Cutaneous just means, or it's a fancy word for glands that are just under the skin, like your sweat glands. This gland is commonly rubbed on vegetation during the rut to mark a buck's territory. The next slide 
you can see on the left a yearling buck versus an adult doe. You can see the prominent cheek patch right by the jawline, the dark muzzle, and the prominent horns. Where on the right, you cannot see a cheek patch and it's very light in color, same with the muzzle and the horns are essentially not visible. Another interesting um, adaptation of pronghorn is that they have coarse, dense, hollow hair that has exceptional insulation properties, which help them withstand extreme temperatures in both the summer and the winter. These temperatures can vary from below freezing during the winter months to above 100 degrees during the summer months. Pronghorn also have an oily substance on their skin, which is secreted by a cutaneous or skin gland, and it pulls out very easily, the hair does. When you fill dress and skin your pronghorn, you have to be careful not to get the hair all over the meat because the oil from the hair can, create, can affect the meat quality, which we'll get into later. Another adaptation for pronghorn is that they are very fast. They're the fastest land animal in North America. Pronghorn have been clocked at up to 60 miles per hour. Among land-based animals, they are second only to the cheetah in speed. Pronghorn evolved the ability to run fast as an anti-predatory strategy. Pronghorn evolved in the wide open spaces of the West, so you can see as when fences come up or farms go into place and they can no longer roam freely, that their numbers would decline. And that ability to run fast to evade predators worked better than the ability to hide or to be able to move across steep, rocky terrain. The next slide, I'll discuss another adaptation that pronghorn have, which is their eyesight, which is phenomenal. Their eyesight has been compared to a human using eight power binoculars. They can spot movement at particularly long distances. Due to the positioning of the eyes on the side of their head, as you can see here in this image, they can also see around 270 degrees, which basically means unless you are directly behind them, they can see you. These adaptations coupled with their running ability are what have made the pronghorn so successful at thriving in wide open spaces of the West. In the next slide, I'll discuss the horns of pronghorn, which are unique compared to true horns like bighorn sheep and mountain goat have that never shed. Um, pronghorn horns are made of keratin or compressed hair, as you can see here in this image possibly of a shedded sheath at which they, um, which is similar to true horns like bighorn sheep or mountain goat have, but they shed every year. The reason most people don't notice that pronghorns shed their horns is because when they shed the current year sheath, there is already another sheath forming underneath the old one. So it just looks like a smaller buck when it sheds. You also won't find shed pronghorns sheaths as often or as easily as deer or elk sheds because of their structure. Because they're made of compressed hair material, the horns weather and disintegrate very quickly and rodents also chew them up very quickly. Um, in Nevada, pronghorn shed their sheaths in late fall, early winter. Next, I'll discuss the ecology of pronghorn, which involves their annual social structure, her composition, cycle of life, and some go briefly over habitat and food requirements. So first, we'll discuss the habitat requirements of pronghorn. During the spring and summer, the majority of a pronghorn's diet consists of forbs with the secondary component of young green grass shoots and a few shrubs. As late summer and fall comes around, forbs disappear and as grass cures out and pronghorn switch their diet and pronghorn will switch their diet to dominated by shrub species. So with the annual herd composition cycle, we'll start with early summer when um, increased antagonism or hostility between bucks begins around the 1st of July in Nevada. This is after fawns are born, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, this is the beginning of when harem formation starts. A harem is just a fancy word for where one male defends multiple females within a territory. So during this July, early July time frame, a male will begin finding a territory with great habitat resources, and it will def defend that territory against other mature bucks. In most of Nevada, the peak rut occurs in the first couple weeks of September and continues into October. 
Um, another interesting note about female pronghorn is they usually mate for the first time in their second September of life, so when they're about a year and a half old, and the gestation period, which is a fancy word for pregnancy duration uh, of a pronghorn is about eight months. In the next slide, you'll see bucks sparring, which this is one way they'll defend their territory, which as I mentioned before, they decide based off the quality of the habitat. So when another buck comes into the area, they'll try to defend against that buck. Um, actually, this sparring doesn't occur as frequently as you think, um, and they'll they will confront each other um, on occasion, but it's not as frequent as you would think. And then, however, so as bucks will spar, as in the image here, they more often times than not spend more time putting on a show of pawing the ground, chasing each other around, and horning vegetation. So in the next slide, you'll see a scrape of what a pronghorn does to mark its territory. These scrapes are called spuds, which just stands for scratch, paw, urinate, and defecate. The buck will make these scrapes in the most obvious, easily noticeable places they can. Dirt roads, especially the smaller, less, less traveled ones, running through pronghorn habitat usually have a lot of spuds on them. Driving these roads, looking for these marks, is a good way to see if there's a mature buck or two in the territory. So then after the rutting period and um, bucks lose their sheaths and it begins winter time, they antelope tend to form in large groups, meaning they're gregarious. It just essentially means a large group of antelope. So as, as I mentioned, late in the fall, when temperatures drop and increased precipitation falls, pronghorn quit being tied so closely to permanent water sources and they can venture out in these larger groups and utilize habitat that was inaccessible during the dry months. The timing of these migrations varies considerably throughout the state and even year to year. The, ma the major factors regulating movement are weather and ground conditions. Migrational movements of over 100 miles have been recorded, but in Nevada movements are generally less than 50 miles. When ground conditions initiate movement, which typically occurs in 10 to 12 inches of snow to force them into another valley or another location, the migration can happen very quickly. Animals will move very long distances in only a day or two. It is also interesting to note in Nevada with the different latitudinal component that some herds do not migrate at all and only exhibit daily movements. And this is obviously dictated by habitat conditions. So then in the spring, um, the large winter herds of pronghorn begin to break up into smaller herds. The spring migration to summer range is a lot slower, more leisurely than the winter migrations due to reduced or lower temperatures and green up. Um, they're not as reliant on water at this time. And during the spring, most mature bucks tend to prefer to stay by themselves. Young bucks will often farm bachelor groups. You will see some younger bucks with the doe groups this time of year, but it's kind of could be either way. And prior to partruition, which is a fancy word for giving birth, does will leave the herd and seek a more secluded area. Fawning in Nevada typically takes place around mid-May through early June. And so does are typically more gregarious than bucks and will stay in groups except when they're giving birth and for a short time afterward until the fawns are large enough to keep up with the herd and not be separated from the mothers. In the next slide, I'll discuss pronghorn hiding posture, um, which you'll see in this image and some of the anti-predatory strategies that pronghorn fawns have and does have. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, fawning occurs in mid-May to early June in Nevada. Twinning is the rule for pronghorn. Um, pronghorn had developed a number of defense or anti-predatory strategies or traits for fawning. And as you can see here in this image, um, it depicts the hiding strategy of pronghorn fawns. It's interesting to note that pronghorn fawns have cryptic coloration, which helps them blend in. It's also interesting to mention that their scent glands are not developed at first, so they're basically odorless and they have the ability to stay still for long periods of time. 
This time of year, you'll typically see fawns off by themselves, which is another anti-predatory strategy where the doe will leave the fawns bedded in isolation for relatively long periods of time as they go to water sources or start feeding. Does, in, in order to keep fawns scentless, does will also clean the young to eliminate fecal and urinary odors whenever they do return to them. And another interesting aspect of fawning in pronghorn is that it's typically synchronized fawning, so they'll have a lot of fawns in a short period of time to hopefully swamp the predators um, and a shorter window um, and have a shorter window for when the fawns are helpless. And next we'll discuss pronghorn habitats. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Joe. We appreciate all that information. And if you just came on a little bit late and joined us, uh, we do have the question and answer uh, button on our Zoom. Uh, Joe is going to be around to answer any questions for that as well that comes up. So your microphone and the chat is turned off. Uh, so if you do have any questions, click on that uh, question and answer, uh, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll be sure to get that to you. So we, we have another uh, endow biologist, uh, Cooper Munson, uh, who is also out of the southern region in the Pin uh, Panaca, Caliente, uh, and Pioche area. And uh, are you there? I'm here. And thank you, Martin. And thank you, everybody, for attending this webinar this evening. Um, like Martin said, I'm Cooper Munson out of uh, the Panaca field office. Um, and so I'm here to talk to you a little about, about pronghorn habitats. So we're going to look at the uh, grasslands, the steppe, and the desert ecosystem. Um, Trail lake beds are, are a great place that provide early seasonal forbs. Um, the small leafy plants that you see out on the rangeland. Um, and, and in this transition where it goes from a, a brush, um, sparse trees down into a lake bed, um, you know, this will often provide uh, very good habitat for, for pronghorn this time of year. Now we can go to the next one. So the step, um, it, and that, this is a, a transition zone as well, uh, below the tree line oftentimes, and uh, a large area of, of relatively flat area that uh, is mainly composed of brush and then seasonal grasses. Um, <clears throat> This gives the, the pronghorn the ability to see long distances and, and open range to where they can uh, really see predators coming and, and have good escape routes as well. Next. Now the desert plains. Um, this is kind of where the large mountains uh, drain out into the valley bottoms down into some of the, the lower elevations where pronghorn are often seen. Now we've seen pronghorns up, up to 9,000 feet in elevation. Generally that's going to be an early summer um, and then they'll go clear down into the bottoms um, in search of, of forage um, mainly in the winter months and in the fall. Uh, all of our hunters you guys are going to encounter a lot of these pronghorns in that step environment between the, the very bottoms and the tops of those mountains. Next. So water distribution for pronghorn, um, they have adapted to, to be very efficient in their water consumption. Um, optimal water distribution is gonna be <clears throat> below one, one mile in between water sources. We often encounter antelope, uh, um, their pronghorn, uh, beyond distances of two miles between uh, free water sources. And uh, the Department of Wildlife has, has augmented a lot of these water sources with our Guzzler program. Um, that allows us to distribute water along rangelands that have been uh, in a consistent drought and it provides a, a very consistent water source for them. 
next. So now I'm going to get into the management of pronghorn. Um, what us biologists do, how, how we um, come up with how many tags we're going to put out uh, for each individual unit and, and how we get to those numbers. So <clears throat> how we survey our, our pronghorn, um, we can either do it uh, aerially uh, through the use of helicopter or fixed wing aircraft. Uh, this is where we're buzzing across the countryside um, within these units. Uh, once we encounter a group of pronghorn, we slow down, we get as close as we possibly can safely, and we try to classify those, those individuals as either bucks, does, or fawns. And so that ratio that we derive from that survey effort is what really goes into our calculations so that we can model our population numbers to see how many bucks we can remove or how many, how many does for some units uh, that we can remove so that um, we can harvest animals uh, in a conservative manner and yet still provide uh, as much opportunity as possible for our, for our general public. Next. <clears throat> Ground survey. Um, this gets real interesting. Um, most of the time we do this in early fall to mid winter. Um, oftentimes when these, these pronghorn come back into these large groups, we often do these out of a, uh, out of a, out of a truck um, or an ATV, but road conditions uh, often, often uh, limit our ability to get to, a, to places if, if uh, we do have snowstorms or rainstorms where it's totally inaccessible. Um, oftentimes we're encountering groups of upwards of 100 animals um, and counting 100 animals when they see you coming and they're running um, it can get uh, a little frustrating and, and difficult at times. So we do the same thing where we, we try to come up with a composition of how many does, how many bucks, and how many fawns. And that all goes in that same calculation. Next, please. So this slide, uh, we're, we're talking about the return cards uh, that we, we require all of our hunters that, that do receive a tag. Um, once you, your season has finished, um, please go onto your account and fill out your return card. Um, this helps us determine how many people were successful in the field. And that success rate also goes into our calculation of how many permits or, or tags we can allow for that specific unit uh, the following hunting season. Next, please. As Joe had mentioned earlier, um, pre-Western settlement, um, you know, these were all open rangelands um, for thousands of miles. Uh, and then once there was settlement, came fences. And these fences uh, really hampered the movement of pronghorn across the West, um, especially in these valley bottoms where they were moving long distances in heavy snow. Um, this was uh, really shifting movements, stopping movements completely, and uh, which can be detrimental to pronghorn. Um, in this slide, the top one is your standard fence configuration. Um, oftentimes you won't see a, a smooth wire on the bottom. Um, but a smooth wire is what we would like to see on all of the fences to allow animals to go under. The second fence is a, a slight modification to the fence during times of movement of pronghorn, and that allows them to get underneath the fence a little easier. And then the third fence that you see there allows for, for uh, a lot better free movement through the fences and definitely reduces the chances of pronghorn getting caught in that fence. Next, please. So as I said before, that smooth wire on the bottom, that allows for those pronghorn to squeeze underneath uh, without getting any lacerations or removing a lot of that hair 
which is very important to them during those winter months when they're moving across the range. Next, please. And unfortunately, this is what we do encounter from time to time. Um, these are likely private fences. Um, the Bureau of Land Management uh, requires all fences um, newly installed to, to be wildlife friendly. This fence that we see here in this photograph um, is not a wildlife friendly fence. You can see that there's barbed wire strands and then there is uh, there's sheep fence, woven wire sheep fence below that. This makes it very difficult for, for all animals to cross, but pronghorn uh, it have a, a uh, tougher time getting through many different types of fencing. Next, please. <clears throat> so pronghorn can jump. Um, as Joe had mentioned earlier, their eyesight is magnified. So they have a, you know, likely an eight times magnification of their eyesight. So their depth perception is off a little bit. And if you are pushing pronghorn, uh, when they're running up to 60 miles an hour and they encounter a fence, a lot of times their depth perception won't allow them to account for the distance of that fence. Um, in this picture here, we can see that they kind of ran up to the fence, got all bunched up, and then this, this young buck decided he was going to try to jump. And I don't know if he quite cleared it all away. But you can see the majority of those pronghorn do prefer to go under. Next slide, please. Like I said, they do prefer to go under. Um, hopefully all of you tag holders are lucky enough to encounter a wide variety of bucks like this here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so they, they will go under. Um, obviously in this picture, we can see that those pronghorn have gone under this spot in multiple times. And this is one of those spots that we would like to look look at and, and maybe modify that fence to allow more free movement across that fence. Next, please. Guzzlers, uh, as I mentioned before, um, guzzlers are water sources that we have made. And in the bottom picture here, you can see what we call the apron. And that collects rainwater throughout the year. And then it flows into these storage tanks with the drinker on it. Um, this drinker allows <clears throat> all wildlife to, to receive free water year round um, and, and really allows us to expand the range of all of our species. Uh, pronghorn in general um, benefit from this to get, uh, to get water in, in arid environments where maybe there's uh, um, other, other animals using water sources such as uh, horses on the range keep keep pronghorn off of other natural water sources such as springs. In that top photograph, you can see a trail camera just above that that uh, buck's head. And I will remind everybody that uh, trail cameras do need to be removed by August first. Next slide, please. So the distribution of pronghorn, uh, this is the, the historical distribution and uh, the present distribution of pronghorn here in Nevada. Um, <clears throat> through our different management programs um, and guzzler developments, um, we have expanded our, our total distribution of pronghorn across this state, almost three times the number of pronghorn as well. So this really allows for all of, uh, all of our interested um, hunting public and those that just want to observe wildlife. We have a, a, a greatly increased distribution of pronghorn. Next, please. So <clears throat> this is the population and number of tags. Um, now, as you can see, the, the higher spikes are going to be the number of pronghorn estimated in the state. 
to whereas the lower uh, spikes are going to be the number of permits or tags for those. Um, you know, since 1986, we have over quadrupled the number of, of tags allocated to uh, to harvest pronghorn in this state, which is is um, great from a wildlife management perspective. Um, when we manage our populations to the maximum yield that we can um, and still managing them to where they're all healthy herds. Um, this is what we try to do to, to benefit pronghorn numbers and to help our hunting public to uh, have the best opportunity. Next, please. And we'll leave off that for Martin. Yep, and uh, thank you very much, Cooper. And Cooper is going to be your two question and answers. Uh, and so if you got any for him, don't forget to click on the question and answer button and you can type in uh, your question right there. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about scoring uh, antelope. Uh, there's a few things. There's the Boone and Crockett Club and there's the Pope and Young Club. The Pope and Young Club is for archers, uh, anyone shooting archery and the Boone and Crockett uh, is more for the rifle. These are private uh, organizations, and these, what they, these are what they require to score your antelope. Um, a few things with antelope, their, their ear is approximately 6.2 inches long, and their eye is about two inches wide. So it gives you a, a good idea of whenever you're looking at these animals, and you're definitely going to want to be looking at those ears because some of you are going to be holding a tag that says uh, uh, pronghorn horns longer than ears or horns shorter than ears. So you're going to be looking at this uh, ear anyway, and that will give you a good judgment on kind of the length of that horn. If you do have a tag that requires uh, uh, horns to be shorter than ears. Both horns must be shorter than the ears. Uh, if uh, your tag is uh, antelope with horns longer than ears, uh, only one horn has to be longer than either of the ears. These are a couple of the past uh, records uh, of pronghorn. Uh, they were taken down in Arizona. They tied for number one. They both scored 95. And you can just see the length of the horn on the top one there is about 17 inches. And the length of the horn on the bottom one was 19 inches. So there's a lot that goes into the scoring. It's not only just the length of the horn, it's the width and it's your quarter measurements that, that make up the scoring. This is the current uh, Boone and Crockett uh, record antelope. It scores 96 and 48 Boone and Crockett points. It was harvested in 2013 in New Mexico. So just because these are in the, uh, the record books uh, doesn't mean that's the biggest antelope that was ever out there. Uh, people have to take those sheets and they have to get them officially scored to go into those uh, record books. Uh, some people believe in doing that and some people don't. But rest assured in Nevada, we have the Nevada Wildlife Record Book. And as you can see here, uh, our ranking, uh, our number one ranked antelope is currently 95 and 6 eighths, not far off from that Boone and Crockett uh, world record. And as you can see, we've got a lot of scores in the 90s uh, and even in the high 80s. And, uh, and unfortunately this year, the, the Nevada record book comes out every five years. Uh, so I'm not sure if any of these uh, scores have changed because with our current situation, that COVID-19, uh, the record book is not gonna be released until the fall of 2021. But uh, be assured that Nevada has some really nice antelope uh, and uh, a very great potential for getting a real nice uh, trophy. This is just an example of a yearling buck. And if you look at letter C, the length of the horn, uh, eight and five eighths, eight and five eighths. That's that's kind of a you know a, a decent yearling buck. Uh, one thing to, uh, with antelope is uh, you know they can be really uniquely different, uh, and a lot of times uh, the spread of the horns uh, does not calculate into the scoring of the antelope. 
Uh, it's really the length and the circumference. Um, so this is kind of a yearly buck, and you can see this one scores about 53 and, and 0 eights. And then for a trophy buck, uh, this one here, if you start looking at the length of those horns, 17 inches, uh, you start getting into the high or the, the low 80s, mid 80s. Uh, if you get anywhere into the 70s, even the high 60s, uh, you can end up in the Nevada record book. And so for some of us who just recently took a hunter education course and applied for tags, you're going to remember these four primary rules of firearm safety. Uh, if you are a person who took a hunter education course quite some time ago, please refresh yourself in these. Uh, the number one is point the muzzle in a safe direction. Number two is treat every firearm with respect to a loaded gun. Number three is be sure the target and what is in front of it and beyond it and keep your finger outside the trigger guard until you're ready to shoot. Uh, we want you to have a safe and enjoyable hunt this year. And these are Nevada's four primary rules of firearm safety. As some of our biologists talked about a little bit earlier, uh, it's fairly, uh, a fairly small uh, stature of an animal. Uh, so a well-placed shot is going to be extremely important uh, in this animal. And you can kind of, this gives you an idea here of your, uh, your vital areas uh, compared to a much larger species. Uh, and this bull elk here uh, gives you, you know, a lot more uh, room for error in your, in your shooting. Uh, take a quick look at these five photos. Uh, there's a couple good ones in here. And uh, we'll start with A, uh, a running antelope is, is always a, a poor target. Uh, number one, you're swinging on this with a high powered rifle uh, and the animal is heating up. Uh, its energy level is extremely high. Uh, always a poor shot uh, shooting at a running animal. If we look at B, uh, we've got a nice broadside animal just taking a step and an excellent backstop. So B, would be a great shot. If we look at C, C is also a great shot. The animal is quartering a little bit toward you. Uh, it just took a step and once again, you can see your backstop there, nothing in the back and uh, nothing in the way of that. Uh, D is a neck shot. Uh, a neck shot in my opinion is always a very poor shot. Uh, if you don't hit the spinal column, uh, you've got a wounded animal. And as some of our biologists uh, spoke earlier, these animals can move very fast. And very fast means very far in a short period of time. Uh, a neck shot to me is always a poor shot on the antelope. It's a very small area. And E, uh, the animal is in a good uh, a broadside position. Uh, but even if you know this area, if you're used to this area, uh, we don't really know what's on the other side of this hill. Uh, could be a rancher out there. Could be a new camp that somebody just set up. Uh, so be sure of your backstop. This is just another quick example uh, of the skeletal. And you can see how small that uh, neck vertebrae is that goes up to the base of the skull. Uh, very hard to hit that, especially at, at uh, some sort of a distance. Uh, recognize the opportunity when it uh, presents itself to you. Uh, don't make any shot. Uh, you're hunting. Uh, you've got plenty of time. And here's why I tell you that. Uh, here is the average number of days that the hunter scouts, uh, which if we look at pronghorn for rifle, less than two days of scouting. If we look at the number of days hunted for pronghorn, uh, it's just about 2.7 days. If you look over at the desert bighorn sheep and the bull elk, uh, 10, 11 days, uh, desert bighorn sheep, uh, six and almost, almost six and a half days. And then when we look at our success ratio uh, for 2019, if we look at antelope, we see we're right about 62%. So if you can compare this uh, scale to what we just looked at, and look at the California bighorn sheep and the desert bighorn sheep, how they're nearing 90% success. Uh, if you spend some more time scouting and you spend some more time out in the field hunting, uh, the percent uh, of success in antelope 
uh, uh, can rise way up into those 80s and 90s. And the reason why I say that, because that's kind of the number one question I always get every year is, uh, what are my chances? Uh, what, what am I going to, do I stand a chance of getting an antelope? Uh, well, that's going to be up to you. Uh, it depends on how much you put into it. So uh, above all things, though, uh, please practice hunting etiquette. Uh, leave your camp or hunting area in better condition uh, than when you found it. It is the number one reason landowners close access to their property is littering. Uh, I know you guys are going to have trash bags with you. If you see some litter uh, in an existing spot where you're camping, uh, uh, please try to pick it up. I know it doesn't always seem fair, but uh, we have to set an example for not only us right now, uh, but for our future generations to come. Uh, remember to pick up your shell casings and yield to other hunters. Uh, if you see another hunter already has a, a specific animal in his sight or has a blind set up and using it, move to a different area. There's lots of antelopes out there as our biologists kind of showed us some of the maps uh, and some of the locations and the quantity. Uh, that's out there. Understand that not everybody hunts, uh, and some find the idea not very appealing. Uh, you shouldn't stop hunting, but you should exercise discretion and handling and transportation of the carcass of the kill. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of that uh, a little bit further on. Uh, above all things, use some common sense. Not everything prohibited or rude is expressed as illegal or against the law. Uh, but be accommodating to other hunters, non-hunters, and the landowners, uh, and it will make it the best experience uh, possible. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some techniques uh, and some things that you're going to need uh, as a, a pronghorn hunter. Uh, number one, if uh, you're going to do a lot of glassing, uh, glassing is the uh, usage of binoculars uh, and and preferably sitting on some type of a tripod. Because for those of us who's used binoculars a lot, you know you can only hold your binoculars in your hands for so long. Uh, use your eyes. You can cover much more ground with your eyes than you can ever with your legs. Uh, so get uh, uh, binoculars uh, with a tripod so you can scan the countryside. Remember, sometimes these antelope are out there. You drive by, you don't see them, but maybe they're bedded down and then they stand up. So spend some time on looking at those open fields. A spotting scope is really a great idea here. Uh, if, uh, if, if you're looking for a trophy, uh, or even if you have the horns shorter than ears or horns longer than ears, you could see a group of three or four or five antelope out in the field way out there, and maybe all of their horns are shorter than their ears. And you have a tag that uh, dictates longer than ears. So a spotting scope is a great opportunity. Some hunters, uh, uh, mostly archery, uh, but some rifle hunters uh, use silhouettes, uh, like in the bottom left-hand corner there, of antelope. Antelope are very curious, uh, and uh, they'll sometimes uh, come if you're uh, to you if they see something like that. Uh, also, blinds. You can set a blind up. Uh, here's uh, the center picture. There's a blind on a, on a water hole. Uh, just keep in mind uh, that depending on what land you're on, whether it be U.S. Forest Service or the BLM land, there are restrictions on blinds like that. They can't be permanent. And above all things, that center picture up there is a rangefinder. And a rangefinder is extremely important because you may be seeing stuff like this. Your shots may be anywhere from 100 to 300 yards. If you're not comfortable with that, if you haven't been to the range, and you look at an animal like this and you think it's 300 yards, put your rangefinder on it, it might be 450. Uh, so you're going to have to get closer or use a different approach, come around the backside. Uh, so a rangefinder is very important. Above all things, know what you can hit. There's nothing wrong with passing up a shot. If you don't think you can do it, you should have been to the range practicing. If you don't think you can make that shot, then either get closer or take a different approach or even find another herd if there's no option there. This also come uh, to us from some of our uh, uh, other agencies throughout the state and, uh, and uh, to become an outdoor mentor. Uh, there's a lot that we enjoy and a lot that hunters uh, 
uh, come up with funding uh, for the great outdoors. Uh, litter is not one of them. Uh, it's not natural. Uh, so please make sure you pack your trash out. Uh, and if you can, uh, clean up any other areas uh, uh, in your campsite that, <clears throat> for the benefit of the doubt, that a hunter unfortunately accidentally left or forgot behind. Fire danger. Uh, this time of year, you are going to be hunting during prime time fire danger. Uh, prevent wildfires. Uh, make sure your fire is dead out. Uh, don't leave a uh, campfire warm for the next guy thinking somebody's coming along. Uh, there may be nobody coming along. And this uh, photo at the bottom right hand corner uh, hits home to me a little bit. It's uh, for a company I used to work for before I came to the Department of Wildlife. And uh, this is a, is a private land. It's a private forest company. And uh, this fire uh, was started by an uh, a campfire that was not put all the way out. So sometimes that simple fire, which we, we all enjoy, and it looks so peaceful, can turn into this. It can be a raging disaster. And you can see a lot of animals in that area. We're fortunate enough there was rivers in the area, and uh, they all ran to those rivers to try to avoid this, even though it, it doesn't, doesn't really always mean that they made it out of their lives. So please be careful with, with fire. What can we do to prevent it? Uh, drown and stir your campfire. Make sure it's completely out. Uh, if you are a smoker, please do not discard your cigarette out the window. Uh, have something in your vehicle that can, can contain that. Uh, shooting also can make sparks and create uh, uh, some fires. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, uh, but be aware of your surrounding. If you've just uh, done some shooting at an antelope uh, and then you start to see some smoke, be aware of that. Uh, Dragging chains. If you're pulling a trailer, uh, whether it be an ATV trailer or a camp trailer, uh, make sure your chains are not dragging. Uh, sometimes uh, you start off, they're not dragging. So periodically check your chains, make sure they're off the ground. If you do have an ATV, make sure it has a spark arrester. And above all things, if you're on a two track uh, with a low hanging muffler or something, make sure you're not catching any of that cheap grass or any of that other dried grass on fire. Uh, if we can eliminate all these uh, reasons that forest fires start, uh, we're kind of left with one, and uh, that would be lightning. And uh, so uh, we have a long way to go to kind of perfect that one yet. So please uh, keep this in mind. Uh, the next thing we have is a professional a taxidermist uh, who is gonna come up, he's got some great ideas. And uh, every year, uh, as I uh, mentioned, uh, people say, no, I have no intention of, of getting my trophy mounted. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, I don't like that. And then they come up with uh, getting a really nice antelope and they change their mind. So visit a taxidermist first, uh, see what he or she requires uh, and, and have an idea uh, of that just in case it happens to you. But we have Mr. Ryan Werner here and he's got some great tips uh, uh, to doing some things uh, to make sure uh, that your mount comes out looking good uh, should you decide to do so. So Ryan, are you there? I am and thank you Martin and uh, the Nevada Department of Wildlife for putting this on. Uh, very happy with what we do in the state. Uh, again, my name is Ryan. This is my assistant here. A very handsome fellow. Uh, we're going to be going over a few things and again, um, Talk to your taxidermist. Get involved with them. Talk to them. Uh, we're available. My number's uh, put out. You can text with questions tonight. Uh, we're always available for any questions or help that you can get. So basically, I'm going to give you just a little gear list to pack before you go. Of course, you're going to want your knife. Uh, we use the Havilons, uh, have the interchangeable blades. Uh, your tag. Your tag is important. It changed a few years ago. We now have multiple uh, portions of it. So we have to have your taxidermy portion of your tag to be able to accept your animal to begin with. Uh, so once you have your knife, um, you can freeze water bottles that you're using. Those are a great form to take with you. They stay frozen longer. Uh, a small tarp, you can get a small tarp. It will help you keep everything clean when you're going to field dress your animal. 
uh, a cooler. Uh, you want one cooler for your meat and one for your head. And if you look, there's a styrofoam cooler, which is the best to keep your head and hide in. Uh, also a game bag, a plastic bag, and uh, a plastic bag to avoid um, water getting on your hide. So there's a few different ways you can skin it and, and taxidermists are different, but the way we prefer is if you look at your screen, you see the antelope that has a line down the middle of it. The first thing that we like to do when we approach your animal, after you have a, an ethical clean shot, which definitely helps with your mount. So practicing with your firearm helps, but we like to cut a circle around the entire animal. And, and the reason being is forms nowadays go back a lot further. I don't know if you can see perfectly, but they go back so much further. This is a wall pedestal. So with the forms going back, we need more hide to make it look uh, better on the form. So the first one you'll cut is around the body. And then the picture, if you're looking at the screen on the left, you'll cut all the way up to the back of the skull. You'll open that up. And when you open that up, you'll have your arms right in here. You want a ring around your arm, and then you can tube it. Can I see the hide, please? You'll tube it. Uh, once you tube it, then you'll skin it off the animal. So we're going to replace my assistant for a second, and we're going to put on the form. So when it comes off, you're going to want to take it, open up your hide, and to let it cool off, Try to set it in some shade, let it breathe and let it get an initial cool down before you put it in the cooler. So this is, like I say, a form, it goes behind that front shoulder a little bit. So that's something that you wanna be aware of. Um, once you get your hide off, continue field dressing. You wanna keep everything cold and dry as possible. So what we like to do, and I'll get a box and show you, is, have your hide out, get everything else set aside. Then you'll start fill dressing, get everything ready. Well, when you're done, we're gonna pretend this is, we're at home, so we used our own resources. We're going to put our styrofoam cooler here, and then with the hide and horns, we have me the bag, please. With the hide and horns in it, this is kind of similar, because your, your head will still be in your, your cape. So it'll look similar to this opened up and back, hopefully with a couple less holes in it. So then we're going to open the bag. And then once we put this in there, you're going to put ice around your cooler a little bit on the bottom. You're going to put your bag in there and then you're going to put it inside your cooler. Okay. You do not want to seal your bag. You want to leave your bag open. That way you can breathe and it won't get, uh, it won't sweat or get bacteria growing in it. So leave it open. Once it's in, your antler or your horn will stick out of the cooler a little bit. Well, if you get the styrofoam with your knife, you can cut out a notch for, for your antler sticking out, kind of like what the display is that Martin put up on the screen, and then duct tape it and seal it. The best thing you want to do for all of it is keep your animal uh, clean, dry and cold and uh, the least amount of blood you can get on it the better if you do get some blood on it you can wipe it off a little bit uh, these are the hardest animals to preserve and you need to do a lot of planning prior to this hunt because you're going to be hunting in august it's going to be extremely hot you're gonna be uh, probably 100 degrees in some areas if you're hunting here down in the south a little closer. So be prepared, be ready, uh, skin it immediately. You don't wanna leave it. Uh, Chuck will get into a lot of it. We ask that you keep your hide the same way you would your meat. You wanna keep it, like I say, cold, clean, and dry. Um, I'm sure I missed some things. So again, my phone number will be there. Uh, this is the first time we did it. It was a great opportunity. Uh, a couple more things that we do is I do officially score for the Nevada wildlife record book. Um, our hours, uh, are going to be hunting season is a little tough. We're available to hunters all hours of the day and night. We just ask that you call ahead of time and then we can meet you down to the shop. 
Also, if you're using somebody else or you're just not even going to do anything, if you just need help, give us a call. Uh, we have our website going, WinnerFamilyTaxidermy.com. Has some more uh, items and more uh, field care things that you can do on there. We'll answer all your questions. It's a fun hunt. A lot of taxidermists will still, if you don't use your cape, um, please don't waste it. Where there's a lot of programs out there, we can use cape replacements for, for hunters that when they go bad, because sometimes you can look at an antelope and it, it'll, the hair will fall out. They're just that finicky. Uh, we also make, you know, have programs where we make leather gloves for veterans and wheelchairs. There's a, a ton of things that you can do with all the parts of your antelope not to waste it. Um, it's a fun hunt. They're, they're beautiful mounts. Again, uh, thank you guys for, uh, for the opportunity and good luck up there and congratulations to all you tag holders. So thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you, Ryan. And uh, uh, Ryan's going to be here too. So if you have joined us a little bit later or anything, there is a question and answer button down at the bottom. Uh, feel free to click on that and uh, ask any questions on that you like. And uh, if you didn't get his uh, number or email or anything, it's going to show up at the end of our presentation as well. So the next person I would like to interest is uh, 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 bring introduce, up, introduce, introduce <laughs> is, uh, is uh, actually a local celebrity. Uh, he's been on uh, uh, diner, uh, diners, dives, and drive-ins. Uh, he's been around the Las Vegas Valley for several years, and his family uh, has been here. He's uh, seen a lot of stuff, and he's going to talk to us about field care. And this is John Mulls Meats, and he also uh, runs the Roadkill Grill, and his name is Chuck Former. Well, thank you, Martin. I appreciate that. Can you hear me, Martin? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, hey, sorry about that. Hey, I really appreciate you guys having me on board. It's great. And uh, Martin's giving me a lot of uh, credit for where credit's not really due. Actually, I'm not a celebrity, but I'm a legend in my own mind, by the way. If you uh, stop in to see off, Chuck, he'll, uh, he'll definitely give you his autograph. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for whatever that's worth. Uh, as as Ryan was stating, and as everybody else has stated, this is a very warm hunt. So initially, you want to take a lot of preparation before you go. In other words, you want to have ice. And the best way to, to form ice would be to get a gallon bucket or a couple of gallon buckets, probably about five or six. Fill them with water. Make sure that they're frozen extremely solid before you actually, uh, before you actually go out on the hunt. Uh, have a large, say a, a quart ice chest. You can pick them up from Sam's Club for about sixty dollars. They work good for transporting your animal after you shot it. Uh, uh, to start with, uh, the first thing you want to do when you've harvested your animal is make sure that you remove the hide and the entrails. Uh, descriptive job of showing you how to actually skin your animal uh one thing that I, I will give you a tip on as in the preceding picture when they introduce me you'll see that the gentleman is wearing gloves uh the ante antelope have very hollow hair and it has a tendency to stick to your fingers as you're skinning especially with the oil that's in your, your bare palm so you want to actually wear gloves while you're doing this that way it'll free the hair from the meat because once you get that hair on the meat, it's over the course of time. There was already a question that I answered uh, on the question and answer period. Uh, a lot of people are kind of uh, concerned with uh, do the animals have diseases when you're hunting. Uh, for the most part, we've got some very healthy animals. Uh, the, the antelope are extremely healthy in the state of Nevada. I think I've processed over 4,000 antelope over the course of 40 years, and I've only seen a handful that had any type of uh, distress as far as uh, a disease or a physical blemish. Uh, for the most part, the, the majority of the, the problems I've seen with animals in general has been the field preparation. 
what happens is uh, people harvest the animal and they they place it on the hood of the car, they put it on the roof of their vehicle, and they transport it back to, to Vegas from all over the state. And what happens is they never get a chance to properly cool down. And in doing so, they have a tendency to spoil. Or even if they don't spoil, they have a very, uh, very tainted taste. That's why you have a lot of people that, that make the statement that they don't like the taste of antelope, which Conversely, antelope is a very, very good, re rich meat. It does have a bit of a gamey taste, but if it's processed properly, it has a very, very unique, very good taste. Uh, there's basically four major factors that are gonna that are gonna inhibit the influence of your your yield on your pronghorn or antelope, and that'll also influence the taste of your antelope. If, uh, if I may, there's the, four, the four factors are basically, number one, the shot placement. As Martin's already discussed, the antelope is a very small animal, so you really don't want to shoot it in the hind, and you really don't want to shoot it in the neck. Preferably, you want to shoot it right behind the shoulder so that you can get, if you can, get a hard shot, because that'll, that'll minimize the amount of damage that you do to the meat. And... For the most part, you don't want to shoot one running because that also has a lot of adrenaline rush to it. And with that adrenaline rush, you get a much stronger flavor. And number two, field dressing. Okay, that's very important. Like I, like I just said, when you field dress the animal, you want to make sure that you don't get any hair on the animal. Now, you're going to have some residual hair. And if you bring a torch along with you, just a camp torch, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this for fear of fire, but honestly, if you have a, a small Col Coleman torch or you can have a, a brazing torch, you can actually just uh, burn that residual hair off before you actually place it in the ice chest. Uh, before you place it in the ice chest, after you've skinned it and, and taken the entrails out, you want to let it air dry so it brings the, the internal core temperature of the animal down hopefully to about 70 degrees. Because if you put it in too warm, what happens is that ice chest is actually gonna retain that heat rather than retain the cold. So that's very important that you let it air dry before you put it in the ice chest. And that's after you've taken the skin off. Number three, handling. This is very important also. As I just said to Put it on the hood of the car with the heat of the, the engine is a no-no. Number two, leaving a hide on it and placing it on the roof of the vehicle is also a no-no. As a matter of fact, I would say about, about six years ago, I had a general it was a, It was an antelope. Yeah, we're we're losing some a little bit of your audio there, Chuck. And had it on. All right, we had uh, we had a gentleman bring in an antelope on the on the roof of his his samurai, uh, Isuzu samurai, and there just happened to be uh, law enforcement in the parking lot, and they saw this animal on top of the the roof. This guy was a retired law enforcement uh, officer. And he had made a phone call to have that animal checked out because he didn't think that was very, uh, very kind to have this animal on the top of this vehicle. Well, the following day, the Department of Wildlife came in and they checked, you know, they generally come in and check tags and they make sure that everybody's punched their tags correctly. Well, in this particular situation, they checked on this antelope that was brought in on the hood of this vehicle. Well, the tag stated horns shorter than the ears, and this gentleman had shot an antelope with horns longer than the ears. Now, had he not driven this this animal on the top of the the samurai, he probably would have never been recognized for that violation. So that's just one incident where uh, not properly transporting the animal is not a good idea. Uh, Number two, transporting the animal. If you decide not to put it into a nice chest, 
and you put it in the bed of the vehicle, be very careful and be under the assumption that there's a lot of road heat. So that road heat will actually make the animal uh, turn bad, sour up. And with the amount of money that you spend to hunt and the amount of time it takes to get a tag, that's the last thing you want to do. And that's a good point, uh, Chuck. If, for all of us knows, once you drive down a dirt road for a few miles, uh, you know how your, your gear in the back of the vehicle looks as well. So just imagine having the meat lane uh, back there. So you want to keep it clean. So the cooler is the best opportunity to, to get it in there. And I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, because I've, I've experienced a lot of animals, uh, antelope, elk, deer, along, along the way. Yep. You couldn't get the dirt off of them. I mean, it was possible. And you, and you don't, I mean, it's a little too gritty. Uh, finally, processing. Uh, an antelope is a very small animal and I honestly think that everybody that hunts antelope should attempt to process their own antelope. I mean, I know, I know I'm cutting my own throat because I'm in business to process game, but it's a very small animal and it's very easily handled. And on our website, we actually have, uh, we have an animal being broken down and, and cut into portions, cut into final, final finished process. You can check that out. That's johnmallsmeat.com. Or you can just go to the web and you can pull up. Uh, YouTube has a lot of great videos that show you how to process them. And, and as I said, I don't, I'm not deterring the, the fact that we are processors. I'm not trying to get around that. But I think <laughs> that everybody should attempt that themselves. Yep. And, and, and Chuck's going to be here for a, a little bit too for question and answers. And uh, if you – have any uh, questions later on that come up, you can always contact him at his store there. Are you trying to say I'm getting long-winded, Martin? Is that what you're doing, man? Nope, we're just going on to the <laughs> next topic. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, I love you, Martin. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Hey, so Chuck's going to be around, so if you got any questions for him, feel free to use that question and answer box. And our final speaker uh, for this webinar tonight is uh, uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife Game Warden, uh, Thomas uh, Hamlin. Thomas, are you there? Yes, Martin, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, yeah, I'm, like Martin said, I'm a game warden down in the southern region out of Las Vegas. Uh, and I'm here to just talk about a few of the uh, more common uh, violations that we encounter in regards to the antelope season. Uh, the first one that uh, tends to be the most common relies basically right back to what Martin said earlier with hunter safety is be sure you're shot and what lies beyond it. Everybody in Nevada is obviously taking, most people have taken hunter safety that are hunting. Uh, antelope are a smaller creature as discussed by Cooper and Joe earlier and they're also gregarious, meaning they get into herds. Um, them being smaller means that a bullet will pass through and through into a possibly another animal if they are in another herd or if they're in a big herd. So being sure of what your uh, shot is and what is behind it is uh, of the utmost importance. I know there's a question earlier that asked uh, what happens if they are in a herd and you take a shot. Um, personally, I would say that self-reporting is the best option in this answer. Um, usually there, you know, mistakes happen um, and everybody in the law enforcement division understands that mistakes happen. Um, but self-reporting is your best, best option in those circumstances. Next, please, Martin. Uh, this goes right along with making sure of your shot and what lies beyond it. Uh, moving shots pose problems. Uh, like I said again, Joe and Cooper already touched on it with how fast antelope are. Uh, most people are not geared to making a shot of an animal moving that fast. Uh, this poses problems of shooting something of the wrong sex. Um, or shooting multiple, like I said before, on getting a possible through and through shot. Next, please, Martin. Uh, poor shot um, on, a, on a moving antelope or taking a quick shot leads to a waste of game. A uh, waste of game is not only an issue ethically, but it's also an issue legally. Uh, wasting game uh, can lead to a 
potential wanton waste violation. Uh, wanton waste violation, for those that don't know, uh, your violations are based on demerits. And demerits are basically what leads to possible um, issues with losing your hunting privileges. Uh, wanton waste violation is automatic 12 demerits, which means you lose your hunting privileges for 12 years. And uh, in no way am I saying that you should not attempt to retrieve an animal that you think you made a poor shot on. It is your ethical responsibility to do so and to attempt to retrieve the animal. Um, and if it's something where you made a poor shot and it ends up being wasted, um, that is also a, a situation where self-report is your best option. Um, it's better to uh, better to take the take the hit than ethically leave an animal to lie. Um, going back on how fast they are, I mean they are the fastest North American animal. These animals can travel a long ways, a long, long ways, especially on the flat prairie or the flat step. Um, when they are hit, they are the fastest animals, and if you hit them in the wrong spot, they will move on you and move for a long time. Next, please, Martin. Uh, this comes to the next issue. Um, most of most of you that are in Nevada understand that um, the basins are covered with roads. Um, this is an issue that makes itself very prevalent across the state during the antelope season is shooting from across the road or having a loaded firearm in or on a vehicle. Um, to assess the uh, shooting on from or across roadway first, uh, roadway is usually defined and is defined in Nevada by statutes and the maintained road. Uh, maintained road usually by definition means it is hit with a plow or something to level it at least once a year. Um, so that includes any maintained county roads or maintained BLM for service roads. Uh, a two track, um, this is where it's kind of up to discretion of the game warden and the hunter. Uh, two track roads are usually not a maintained road. Um, still shooting across or from, uh, please make the best judgment in determining whether or not you're interfering or could possibly put somebody else in jeopardy or put um, the animal in jeopardy and not making a good shot. Um, to assess the uh, loaded firearm in a vehicle, uh, specifically it says in or slash on a vehicle. This is true. Um, any vehicle that is placed on a, on a vehicle that is loaded is technically in violation. Um, make sure to uh, pay attention to any vehicle. So a vehicle includes uh, your four wheelers, uh, OHVs, side-by-sides, anything of that nature, those are considered a vehicle. Make sure those guns are unloaded. They will be checked every time you're talking to a game warden. That is one of the first things they'll look for probably before your tag is that your gun is unloaded. Next, please, Martin. Uh, this, this is a phone number for you. Um, Operation Game Thief is a um, awesome hotline for numbers to call. Please write down this number if you don't have it. Uh, this allows people to call in and report things that they've seen that they believe is illegal. Uh, this goes directly to uh, the Game Warden Dispatch Center, and they dispatch it to the Game Warden responsible for the area. Um, this is where the majority of our uh, tips come from. They, uh, this allows for people to remain anonymous if they choose to do so and collect rewards potentially if there's a conviction in uh, a potential poaching case. Uh, this is important also, this could be potentially what you call in to report a uh, mistake. Uh, this is a good way to self-report and um, make sure you do the right thing. Uh, once again, uh, this is something that if you see ever, uh, an issue, I highly suggest not approaching the individuals. Uh, they've already committed a crime. Uh, would, not, would not approach them, but gathering any information that you can uh, potentially license plates, vehicle descriptions, anything of that nature, and reporting it to uh, this phone number would help tremendously in protecting Nevada's wildlife. Go ahead, next, Martin. Uh, this is another thing that we find uh, a lot of issues with, especially in camps. 
uh, antelope being the first season, you're less likely to see trash, um, but you're more likely to possibly potentially leave trash. Um, this can come, uh, this comes in, in camps. Usually by the time deer season rolls around, you can tell where people are camping and that is uh, uh, too bad. Uh, please clean up after yourselves and protect this land. Nevada is blessed to have 88% public land, which means you can access it year round, whether it be for hiking or for hunting. Um, please take care of it and respect that we have some of the best public land options in the United States. Um, as Chuck has said prior, uh, coolers and Martin, uh, coolers are the best way to keep your, your game clean. This goes back into uh, potentially having wanton waste issues. Um, the last thing you want to do uh, is, is wait five years to draw an antelope tag only to have the meat wasted. Uh, majority of hunters don't hunt just for the meat. They hunt for the, um, you know, uh, I'll say that they don't hunt for the, the trophy, but they hunt for the meat. And it would be a, it would be an absolute shame to have your meat wasted based upon just carelessness or recklessness uh, and the excitement of having a potential trophy. So make sure you keep that meat cool, clean and dry on your transport back to wherever your home is. Next please, Martin. Uh, this slide goes into showing the Nevada Administrative Code de defining what a edible portions are. And this goes for what this basically says, what you have to take out of the field when you shoot your animal. Uh, so if we look at the big game mammals, uh, what you're gonna need to take are the front quarters, the tenderloins and the back straps and the hind quarters down to the hawk. Um, this is required. Anything left in the field is considered wanton waste of an animal. Um, so if you only decide to take the back straps because you shot the front shoulder off and you don't want to take the hind, uh, that is, that is going to be a, not a good decision. Uh, make sure you take all edible portions out of the field with you. Next please, Martin. Okay, the valid validation of a tag or permit. As it said in this, in this uh, slide, um, person reaches any wildlife which the person is killed, he or she must validate his or her tag or permit immediately upon by clearly punching out the spaces. Um, clearly punching out the spaces is not uh, just putting your knife through it, making sure that that, you need to make sure that that number, um, date, and sex is clearly cut out. Um, and that the kill unit is clearly placed on that tag. Um, this, this just prevents any issues where somebody may or may not reuse their tag. Um, most game wardens, my, myself included, we, we keep a uh, hole punch with us. So if we do encounter somebody that hasn't fully punched their tag, there's an option too that we can um, punch the tag to make sure it is fully punched in the field. Um, that is just the easiest way to make sure that that tag is completely punched and make sure that number is uh, good to go. Uh, attachment of tag to the animal. Uh, make sure that, um, as it says in, in this uh, that administrative code, it says the permit must be firmly attached to the carcass of the animal killed by the owner at or before the time he or she first reaches his or her means of transportation or camp. So you, the first thing you should do when you get the animal, go ahead and take pictures and do what you need to do. But that tag needs to be validated and it needs to be attached to the largest portion of meat. Um, not to the head. Um, obviously, if you take the head out, that's a different issue. But that, that tag needs to be kept on the meat um, basically until it's eaten, um, whether it be in your freezer at, or at the um, taxidermist. Obviously, Nevada provides um, a tremendous amount of um, permits. So we have a transportation permit. Anybody that has a tag that has received their tag already, you'll notice a transportation permit on the bottom and a tax derby stub on the bottom. A uh, transportation permit is used to, if somebody is transporting your meat for you, say you shot a deer in, in uh, Elko and you live in Las Vegas and they're taking it to a meat processor in Elko. Um, that transportation permit would need to be filled out and attached to the meat so that people know or that 
the any game wardens and the tax and the processor know that that animal is legally harvested. The taxidermy sub will go to people like Werner Family Taxidermy um, to make sure they keep their records straight and that they know that um, that animal was legally harvested. Go ahead next, Martin. Uh, I big thing is, uh, as most people know, in the state of Nevada, we have the most uh, rural and lonely state in the United States. Uh, make sure that be prepared. Make sure you have a plan. Make sure you have your license and tags. Don't leave home without them. Make sure you have maps. Uh, lead gates is found, especially during August. There may be cattle still out on the range. It is a violation um, to leave gates open. Uh, please don't let any cattle out and respect their range. Are you still there, Thomas? I think we might have lost Thomas on the last one there. It looks like he froze up on me. Uh, where we was at, uh, under the being prepared type section, uh, yeah, make sure you check for those fire restrictions. Uh, leave a hunting plan with someone. Or should uh, anything happen to you, it, it's so much easier for everyone to have at least an idea of where you are. Uh, gas, water, water. If you freeze some of the water bottles and have an extra cooler, uh, you're killing two birds with one stone there. Uh, and medications, if you're in any of that. Don't forget to take your medications if you're out there. Uh, it's a very common thing that people do forget. Uh, there's also some hunt unit uh, advisories on the Endow webpage. Uh, feel free to look up your unit on there. It gives you a pretty good idea of what's going on in that unit. Uh, but please make a scouting trip to it. And also uh, know where you are, the state and unit boundaries. Remember that is your responsibility to know that. Uh, did you come back, Thomas? Yeah, I'm here, Martin. Sorry about that. Well, that's okay. Uh, uh, I'll let you take up there where we are with the uh, state and unit boundaries. Yeah, state and unit boundaries are huge, especially nowadays. I mean, obviously you have a unit, uh, Nevada hunting map. Um, as I have in the background here um, with you at all times. Uh, great options nowadays with your phone and GPS are things like Onyx maps. Um, they keep you up to date and active GPS uh, anywhere you go. Um, but know where you stand. Um, that's a, it's a big issue. Um, you don't want to be shooting an animal in the wrong unit or potentially an, an animal in a unit where they do not have uh, open or legal season. Uh, this is just an example. Most people know, obviously, that they have their tags by now, which units uh, they will be focusing in on, um, and make sure you stick to those and do your scouting so you know where you're going and what you're going to be doing. All right. Well, thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mark. We've got, uh, yep, we appreciate all of our uh, guest speakers and our professionals that came on to give you guys some uh, – uh, information on pronghorn hunting in Nevada. Please don't forget our survey. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to hear if you like this, if this was beneficial for you, or other topics that you may uh, want to see coming up in the near future. So please don't forget that survey. Uh, we also have some, uh, some of the contact information here. Uh, please contact us. We have a lot of people working on the questions, and I hope we got to all your questions. If we didn't, uh, please get a hold of us so we can get those answered for you. Uh, my contact is there at the bottom, the Werner Family Taxidermy, John Moles Meats, and our biologist in Nevada. Uh, be safe out there, everybody, and uh, hope you have an enjoyable hunt this year. Thanks, and good night.